Uh, welcome viewers and listeners. Um, we have James Hughes here, who's the Executive Director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And we're going to be discussing the Ukraine-Russia conflict. And it's, I think, the fifth day in today. So welcome, James. Yeah, I was um, looking at the news uh, before we got on air just to make sure that something else hadn't happened in the last 15 minutes, but um, there was a lot going on. Uh, it's very nice to be with you again, Adam. Oh, it's great to have you on the show again, James. And um, with your background as a sociologist and also uh, um, in politics as well, I thought you'd be ideal to talk about this sort of thing. And I've seen you say some pretty interesting things on social media as well. So it, it grabbed my attention. I thought it would be great to have you on the show discussing this at this time, especially. Well, I, I confess that among my peers in left-wing politics, um, there is a disproportionate number of ideologists to actual activists. And I contribute to that because I've never been that great an activist, but I have been thinking and writing about these topics for quite a long time. And um, as a political educator, as well as uh, an educator on the topics that I address more commonly, uh, um, ethics and technology, um, I have been thinking and writing about this since 30, 40 years ago, so. Yeah, indeed. I've seen some of the photos of your old activism. It's quite daring, James, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I was, I grew up, uh, I was born in 1961. In the 1970s, I developed a fascination with uh, guerrilla movements that were occurring around the world soon fortunately, where we was weaned off of that and became what in European terms would be called the Social Democrat around um, 1980. And um, that was a very quiet corner of American politics for many years. <laughs> Calling yourself a socialist in the first place was, um, you know, not a popular thing, but then trying to figure out how you fit in to socialist politics when you um, were an anti-communist, as a, I have always been. And um, when you believed that, for instance, Sweden was the model as opposed to Cuba, um, as I have always done, um, that has also been a small niche. Now, what happened recently was that that niche in American politics blew up with Bernie Sanders and AOC and the resistance to Trump's fascism. Um, but we have a lot of unresolved issues on the American left. And I would say that my understanding of the Ukraine conflict goes back to what I think are the unresolved issues that came out of World War II, which is um, that after World War II, it became clear because of nuclear weapons in particular, but because of the breakdown in political cooperation that led to the appeasement of, uh, of uh, Hitler, that we needed new transnational political institutions that were committed to defend liberal democracy and the rule of law. But the United Nations and the other institutions that were created were created in the context of a Cold War where we were uh, appeasing the Soviet Union and then China. Um, and there was a fundamental conflict between trying to stand for certain kinds of principles of world law and keeping those people in the Security Council and allowing and trying to work with them to reduce global conflict. And of course, the United States was much to blame in this as well, that you know, the United States engaged in direct military interventions in many cases, overthrowing democratically, democratically elected governments, ignoring the multitudes of sins of our allies. Um, and so we made a mockery of the principles of the United Nations, as did the whole process. Um, the roots also of this go back to the shock therapy that we imposed on the Soviet Union. I mean, I was um, ecstatic when the Soviet Union fell. I feel like so Marxist-Leninism, the, the illegal and unjustified coup that Lenin launched against the first revolutionary government in Russia. And from that point on, world, the World Democratic Socialist Project, the Social Democratic Project, had to wave this albatross around its neck of people saying, well, what about that? You know, that looks terrible over there. But don't, we don't want to do that. Um, and they were right. Uh, the Soviet experiment was 
um, successful in frog marching a feudalist country into industrialization, if that's your marker of success. Um, but it was also, you know, horrific totalitarian dystopia, as was Maoist China. Um, and so uh, I felt that when this, the uh, Soviet Union fell, that this was the beginning of a new chapter of history. And part of that chapter for me was that the model of European institutions, the uh, multitude of European institutions, not just the European Union, the European Parliament, uh, NATO, the o OCSE, there are you know, a dozen or more of these kinds of institutions of different agreements that Europe has entered into, collectively called the European Project and supported for the most part by the United States in what's called the Atlantic Alliance. I was a strong, have always been a strong supporter of the Atlantic Alliance. I wrote an essay back in 1991 about the need for world government and why the European Union was a model for the world government that we needed to create. And I know the myriad sins of the European Union. I mean, the left has hated the European Union for um, its structural uh, discouragement of certain kinds of redistributional policies. Uh, it's bu the bureaucracy in Belgium. Um, but, you know, I think for me, the expansion of the European Union was uh, an, an important step at that point. There was a strong debate in Europe about it at the time. Um, Europeans who thought that if the European Union was to remain strong, it couldn't expand too quickly into the former Soviet republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you know, all of the, the Romania, Poland. Um, and to some extent, they've been proven right because Poland and Hungary are fascist regimes, you know, uh, democratically elected, but, you know, authoritarian, far right populist, whatever you want to call it, they're fascist politics. Um, and the, the inability or unwillingness of Europeans to uh, draw a clear line and say, you're not allowed to do the things that you're doing. I mean, they've drawn some lines, but not as clear as I'd like. The uh, problems with Erdogan in Turkey, who would also, you know, it's like, are we gonna let him in? Well, he's a fascist, so probably we shouldn't let him in. All of these problems. Then the U United States, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States imposed or encouraged shock therapy, economic shock therapy on the Russians, which dramatically uh, impoverished them. Um, and instead of doing what we did with Germany after World War II, which was a Marshall Plan to uh, bring them into, to reindustrialize them, bring them into the modern uh, liberal democratic order, and now they are a centerpiece of it and a stable democratic country. Instead of doing that for Russia, we supported Yeltsin, who was you know, a drunken uh, tool and uh, a tool of certain faction of oligarchs who stole all the wealth that they could lay their hands on, and then um, was replaced by Putin, who everyone welcomed because at least he was making the trains run on time. And even though he was also a kleptocratic uh, autocrat with his own group of kleptocrat oligarchs. Um, and so in a way, the United States is responsible. I do not pin that, you know, that responsibility to the expansion of NATO because the idea that former vassal states of an imperialist country would want protection from that country um, and would a petition, they all petitioned to join NATO because they wanted into NATO. Um, it wasn't like we were leaning on them and saying, you really need to join NATO. It's like they wanted into NATO and um, they saw it as a defense of their newly won freedom. And now Kosovo and Finland and Sweden, you know, if. Putin's mission in this particular case was to weaken, which it has been for two decades, it has been to weaken the European Union, to weaken the European project, the Atlantic Alliance and NATO. And he has supported uh, far right actors in all of our countries to do that and far left actors in all of our countries to do that. He doesn't care. As long as you're opposed to the European uh, uh, project and the Atlantic Alliance, uh, Putin would support you. And that was, Allegedly, the reason that he went into the Ukraine was to reestablish greater Russia and uh, create a defense zone against the expansion of NATO. Well, the consequence of this is that he has greatly strengthened the European Union, the European project, the Atlantic Alliance, and NATO, all of which uh, now have sudden leases on life. I mean, Macron, as, as recently as a year ago, 
was arguing that NATO was irrelevant. You will hear none of that anymore. Uh, Trump, quite the, one of the few things that Trump was correct about was that he went to NATO and he said, you guys want American taxpayers to pay for your security and you're not willing to tax yourself even to the agreed upon 2% level of your GDP to support your NATO budget. So why the hell should we be paying for your security? He was right about that. The Europeans, they get the point. Germany, just for the first time since World War II, agreed to increase their defense uh, budget above 2% of GDP or 2% of their budget. Um, Finland and Sweden are considering uh, membership in NATO for the first time. Um, so I, at any rate, I think uh, there is a lot of fault to go around, but uh, just to get back to the post-World War II order, um, this is a technology question as well, because one of the things that the post-World War II situation posed was we now face potential catastrophic risks because of nuclear weapons. And um, in that context, we need to create transnational institutions that, that can ensure collective security and uh, prevent the proliferation of these weapons of mass destruction. And that was good as far as it went, except that then the Russians got it, then the Chinese got it, then the French got it, the Israelis got it, and the U.S. turned a blind eye to the Israelis getting it because they were an ally. And uh, you know, India got it, then Pakistan got it, and so nuclear proliferation was a non-starter. Then we invented weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as a pretext for a neoconservative uh, war for democracy in that country, which had precisely the opposite effect, um, and created ISIS. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so our uh, commitments to, uh, our legitimate commitments to a non nuclear non-proliferation world have always been undercut by Cold War calculations. We need international institutions that can ensure collective security, investigate uh, the development of weapons of mass destruction, uh, levy effective sanctions, and if necessary, police actions to prevent the development of weapons of mass destruction. The Iran nuclear treaty, for instance, is a part of this uh, calculation. What to do about North Korea is a part of this calculation. And, uh, and this is a technology, and it's going to just be the first of when many weapons of mass destruction technologies that we have to deal with. Because pretty soon, you know, COVID was not a bioengineered weapon, but pretty soon we're going to have bioengineered uh, weapons. Pretty soon we're gonna have nanotech weapons. We already have cyber weapons. We, and who knows what, how to have a, a cyber weapon non-proliferation treaty. I mean, we, can, we can all uh, say, well, don't attack other people's water uh, and electrical infrastructure because that would be bad. But we know that Putin has been doing that to uh, former vassal states in, uh, you know, in the Eastern Europe as an experiment for a long time. You know, he's been crippling Estonia and he's been crippling Ukraine uh, with cyber weapons. So we need this global security arrangement if we want to develop technologies which have dual uses. I mean, every cyber weapon is also a useful thing in some other context. Um, dual you know, use, United... dual use. Yeah, dual, so, so dual yeah, yeah. Just, just you want to describe that. I'm sorry. I'm, I think people like don't know what that means. I, I think people can understand that it. it has more than one use, not just two. Right, exactly. I mean, and this is a hard situation because uh, Clinton uh, blew up a, a, a factory in the Sudan in I think 98. Um, and his intelligence told him that it had certain kinds of capabilities that could make biological weapons. Probably true, turned out to be a medicine factory. It's very hard to tell. With nuclear, at least, there's, you know, there's fissile material around that you can kind of detect. Are you, are you boiling your plutonium down to make a bomb or not? But with bioweapons or potentially nanoweapons, and certainly with artificial intelligence, um, those, the weapons and the weaponization or the accidental uses uh, of catastrophic uses of those things are all uh, the same as the positive ones, or you look the same. Anyway, um, ask me a question because I got so many notes here about uh, things I wanted to say about the world.
Yeah, sure. Um, look, uh, there's a lot of people who are concerned about the um, the types of arrangements that may be that, that that will have to be put in place in order to efficiently detect whether people are creating weapons of mass destruction or just doing something silly in their backyard biotech lab. Right. Um, Nick Bostrom has wrote about this in um, yeah, like uh, extensively, and he thinks that one of the options is turnkey totalitarianism. Now, um, this is concerning in itself because you, uh, for, for in the past, totalitarian regimes have been nasty. So um, what kind of arrangement do you see which will be up to the task of, uh, yeah, of just making, being able to wrap it around and find all the, um, the, up, the upstart nuclear actors um, and I guess, you know, calm the ones that do already exist and uh, make sure people aren't doing silly things with biotech and AI. Well, well, let's start. Let me just parenthetically note that one of the reasons we're in this mess is that the Ukraine would have been the third largest nuclear power after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but quite rightly decided to give up all of its nuclear weapons. If it was still sitting on a stockpile of nuclear weapons, this would never have happened. But the Ukraine, to its credit, uh, decided to give them up. Um, at any rate, the Pro, the point about Nick is interesting because, of course, we're friends with Nick, and um, I very much appreciated his argument for the singleton. It is made in the abstract without any reference to actual geopolitical consequences. Um, and I think there's an enormous- well, That's what difference. philosophers do, right? That's the right, name of the exactly. paper I was referring to was the vulnerable world hypothesis, in case anybody's yeah. worrying, wondering. I think there's an enormous difference between global anarchy and a global totalitarian regime. And those who have argued for totalitarianism are in some ways carrying water for the libertarians who want global anarchy. Um, and I think we can find uh, something closer to global governance, but not at the totalitarian end. So, you know, if we had a global security order that could have said to Sudan uh, in the Darfur, when they were uh, carrying out genocide against the Darfur people. Um, if we had a global order that could have simply enforced some basic principles like no genocide, um, would that be totalitarianism? I mean, yeah, I mean, if, you were, if you're Sudan, I'm sure they would have said that that's a totalitarian violation of their national sovereignty, blah, 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 blah. But um, I'm talking about basic agreements that you're, you know, when we say to North Korea, you're not allowed to, uh, threaten your neighbors with nuclear weapons. Uh, how do we enforce that? We need a global institution that enforces that. Now, it, when you start to posit the development of new weapons of mass destruction that are harder to detect, um, then you have to start getting creative because unless we do have the kinds of global controls on science and scientists and intrusive police investigations of every suspected, you know, garage biolab, uh, which would be relatively totalitarian, it's hard to imagine how we would control some of these threats. But for instance, George Church proposed a decade ago that um, the manufacturers of bioprinters uh, or DNA printers um, should all have a proscribed list written into their software uh, in some kind of way that can't be tweaked or, you know, I, I don't know how feasible this is in the long run, but it, that was his proposal that um, if you tried to print something uh, like a lethal bioweapon, it would say, you're not allowed to print that. And it would report you to the central, you know, weapons of mass destruction police. Um, and that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thinking or creative thinking that we need, a, a technological component to a global surveillance and uh, enforcement regime for weapons of mass destruction. It does get difficult when you're building into devices um, the, that, that sort of policing um, where it's very abstract. And as soon as you add one chemical or one component that makes it look like it could go down the path of um, weapons of mass destruction or just do something silly accidentally, then it reports you to, um, I don't know, the weapons of mass destruction police. Yeah, it, there's, there's just so many components out there. They could, they could be hacked. 
I mean, phones yeah. can be hacked. And I mean, look at look how many of them are out there that we've had like a decades of um, time to perfect security measures to put into computers and th thereby phones um, or portable devices. And we still haven't got that right. Um, is it, the, the, the architecture that George Church puts up sounds messy. Um, yeah. It sounds really hard to manage and control, and and um, it seems like you know uh, it, it 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 it's prone to to hacking and even faults. So yeah, I, look, I don't know. I guess I guess is um, the the whole prospect of backyard biotech terrorism uh, gets clearer and comes into focus. We'll know more about what to do, but we. We, we don't want to be, be in a situation where we're blindsided by this sort of thing. So we need to have these sorts of conversations early and often. That's true. Well, let me point to another technology angle on this current conflict. And that is that um, we would not be in the situation if the world had taken stronger steps to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, because the Soviet economy, 60% of it depends on oil and gas. That, and let's point out the Soviet economy is only as big as Belgium and the Netherlands put together, or only as big as Italy. And probably today it's only half that size because um, they just destroyed their economy. But um, the, if, if we had less dependence on those oils, not only would the United States not have played footsie with Saudi, uh, rapacious Saudi dictators for so long, um, but we also would have, at, and Europe would have been less dependent on Putin. And uh, of course, that now there's not going to be an oil pipeline from Russia to Germany. Germany, thankfully, said that they weren't going to do that. And um, they overcame the resistance of short sighted German Greens who had got Germany to commit to denuclearization. And now the plans for denuclearization are off the table. And I support that because I think nuclear is one of the comp necessary technological components of climate remediation. Um, so uh, there is this strong um, element of, you know, the, and, and oligarchs. I mean, how can we imagine Putin taking such a disastrously self-destructive act if he wasn't surrounded by oligarchs who he who depended on his political patronage for their kleptocracy and who were only going to say yes to whatever thing he wanted. Now, it turns out some of the children of these oligarchs really like spending, uh, you know, time in the bistros of Paris and the, you know, their, their dachas in London. And so they've begun to speak out against the war, but we don't yet see the oligarchs themselves speaking out against the war. That might turn things around. You're, you're on mute, Adam. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I woke up this morning. It looks as though the the ruble, the Russian ruble, has jumped by over thirty percent or close to thirty percent. It was, um, I guess, hovering around fourteen cents to the US dollar, and now it's less than one uh, ten cents. So that's that's huge. Um, right. Yeah. So so, do you think? Biden and the European Union. By, by the way, there's some crypto bros who, who have suggested that Putin could get around that yeah, by right. uh, going heavily into crypto. It's like, that's I, right. I support that. You you tell you convince Putin to put spend all his money on Bitcoin because I know where that's headed to. <laughs> now, especially now that G has just uh, put the kibosh on crypto. Right. So, um, it, it, do you think um sanctioning uh Putin? Um, financially, um, and I guess materially is enough, or do you, do we need to send troops in to help Ukraine? The question does so the, the, does the West need to to have more of an on the ground support um, for Ukraine? Okay, so there's a couple steps here. First is the question of NATO, and um, I, as I've indicated already, I support. Uh, the existence of NATO, and I supported the expansion of NATO. And let's just hope that um, there is no direct confrontation between NATO and Russia in this conflict, because we are talking about nuclear, potential nuclear consequences. However, military support 
for the Ukraine, which uh, Sweden has just sent weapons. Germany is sending weapons. European countries are giving permission to their citizens to go and fight as, um, as volunteers for the Ukrainians. Um, all of this unprecedented. The EU has given fighter jets to the Ukraine. Um, I think this is understandable. And although some would say that this is an escalation, you know, it's, it's only workers die in the rich man's wars, blah, blah, blah. I don't think you can see what's happening in Ukraine and not say with Zelensky, send me bullets, I don't need a ride. Um, you know, when he was, when we offered to evacuate him. Um, and by the way, Zelensky is responsible for at least half of the rapid and overwhelming response uh, to the invasion because his courage and the courage of the Ukrainian people has been astounding. So kudos to them. Um, and, I, and I hope that they all survive and, and I hope that the Russians withdraw soon because they don't seem to be having a lot of success. But um, at any rate, yes, I do support uh, the provision of material support. And of course, if the Biden, I'm sure that the Biden administration publicly and covertly is going to be providing military support to the Ukrainians. But we can't do it in a way that um, heightens the possibility of a NATO-Russia war. Now, the only person who's really, I mean, it's Putin's fault for invading Ukraine in the first place. And Putin has been ratcheting that up by his uh, nuclear saber rattling in the last couple of days. So that's really on him because NATO has been very clear that um, Ukraine is not in NATO. We are not obligated to go to war with Russia. If you attack Poland, if you, you, know, if you attack uh, the other countries that have joined NATO, then we've got a problem, but not yet. Um, so, and in terms of sanctions, I think the sanctions have been ratcheted up pretty far, pretty much as far as that they can go. And the debate on sanctions, I think there has been ever since our sanctions, well, and even before uh, the sanctions on Iraq, but our the U.S. sanctions on Iraq, um, which killed a lot of people, um, uh, those were, I think, a big wake-up call for international diplomacy. I think. If you're going to say that there should be uh, an alternative to war, it can't just be appeasement. It can't be that every time uh, North Korea wags its nuclear dick in the, in the air and uh, you know, every time Iran threatens its neighbors and et cetera, et cetera. It can't be that the only thing that you say to them is don't do that again, we're really unhappy with you. There have to be some kind of consequences other than force. That's exactly right. I mean, like, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, actors waiting in the wings, just watching and, and seeing how the world responds to Russia at the moment. Um, now, is, is it the case that they, uh, as long as you've got some nukes, enough nukes to cause some real devastation, then you can use that as a, um, a, a loophole or as a, like a bargaining tool to get anything you want to annex your neighbours without impunity other than just you know, um, you know, financial restrictions. Right. That that has been a lesson that many countries have learned. Um, that's what they say about Iran. You know, it's like uh, Iran learned the lesson of the world that if you want to be left alone and do what you want, that you need to be able to threaten the world with nukes. Now, do I think it's a great thing that um, only certain countries have nukes and others don't? That we don't have this kind of global balance of power. You know, by the way, one of the people who um, has gotten a lot of press in the last week in the United States is a guy named John Mearsheimer, who I studied under at uh, University of Chicago, a, a neo-realist um, foreign policy hawk. And he became famous for the argument that mutually assured destruction makes the world safer because otherwise you have one country can do something and another country, but it, nuclear assured destruction, mutually assured destruction locks everything down. Everybody knows that they can't cross certain boundaries. It's like, and his argument now is that it's the US's fault that we allowed um, these other countries to enter into NATO in a way that was provocative to Russia. And you hear this from the far right in the United States and from the far left. Um, and I do not accept that argument at all. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute, Adam. 
Googled him. I think it, it, we've got the right person. Um, and he, he's saying that we're entering a new Cold War. Um, but I, I believe that other people have commented that we're, we're, we're just coming out of the old one. Right. I mean, <clears throat> the, the new Cold War is a global war of uh, an alliance, a tacit and, so, and sometimes explicit alliance between opponents of the Western liberal democratic world order. And I think this is another part of uh, what I think is important that's going on here. So why is this happening? This global rise of fascism that um, started with Brexit and Trump, Bolsonaro, Erdogan in Turkey, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, Putin in Russia, Xi in China, and you know already an authoritarian regime, but Xi's become you know even more authoritarian than before. Just, I'm um, sure people are wondering what you mean by fascism here, because I think like, uh, can you explain? Um, what you mean, what the definition of f fascism you're, you're using here, because I'm not sure people are aware that Erdogan or the, the president of China are fascists. I'm sure they well, so don't it, identify as fascists. In countries that still have democratic elections, you have what's called illiberal dem Democrats or far right populists or whatever. They undermine democratic institutions, they ban political opponents, they control the press. Um, you know, uh, Orban in Hungary, the Polish uh, ruling party, um, Erdogan in Turkey. These are examples of democratic countries that are ruled by basically fascists. So, you know, Erdogan, after the attempted coup against him, he, he put 100,000 people in prison. And um, you're not allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to be a Kurd in, in Turkey. You're not allowed to acknowledge that the Turks massacred the Armenians. There's all kinds of crazy politics in Turkey. But um, so what I mean by it is there's a consistent logic to the rise of this kind of strongman around the world, whether they're in an already totalitarian regime like Xi in China or a more or less totalitarian regime like Putin's Russia or in a putatively democratic country like Hungary and Poland. And that is um, racial nationalism, uh, a strong opposition to feminism, sexual rights, um, and the Western liberal ideas in general, uh, a lack of interest in egalitarianism for the most part, um, although G you know, talks about common prosperity and the Red New Deal and stuff like this, but it's you know, basically they are uh, protecting uh, plutocratic wealth for the most part against the left's attempts to redistribute it. So racial nationalism has always been available as a mobilization tool. And um, you know we've seen it for a long time and it's only the fact that there were some relatively uh, nice periods in history recently that there wasn't as much racial nationalism as the past. So racial nationalism doesn't really explain anything about the current moment. Why are these uh, racial nationalist movements coming to power? Why is Xi putting a million Uyghurs in concentration camps? Why is uh, Putin uh, launching a, a, a pan-Slavic, uh, Russo-Russian Orthodox church-driven nationalist narrative to restore the errors that the Bolsheviks <laughs> caused? which is what his recent speech said. And I think part of the reason is the economic, uh, the economic uh, challenges that the world faces because of uh, rising inequality, um, economic insecurity, the uh, decline of, of career, stable careers and industrial jobs, the decline of the trade union movement, um, the rise of oligarchs, as I've already said, who are out of touch with uh, popular will, um, the rise of the privileged college educated class, which I'm a part of and I help reproduce, that has taken over progressive politics in Europe. You know, if you read Thomas Piketty, who I think is great on this, he talks about the failure of the European Social Democratic Project and the American Democratic Party and the Australian Labor Party, et cetera, because um, a previous appeal to a working class or blue collar uh, electorate has been replaced by a set of values that really only appeal to college educated people. And the blue collar folks are like, you're, well, you're not woke enough. 
to be in our party. So you should probably just go join the, the far right. And that, that dynamic is happening all over the world. And, um, you know, do we fix that problem by not being woke? Um, uh, do, or do we fix it by addressing the legitimate economic insecurities of working class and blue collar people um, who are tempted by that kind of politics and say, look, I know, you know, that you feel like you get more love from Trump than you do from Biden. But Biden is the one who's actually going to give you jobs and protect your economic security. And he was the one who actually wanted and pressed for giving you uh, a universal basic income during the pandemic. And it's those kinds of economic appeals that can still potentially hold together this coalition of increasingly uh, cultural politics of the college educated work, working class and the uh, the folks in the other way. Anyway, that, so that's an economic dimension. But I think part of the dimension of this that gets very little coverage is the gender dimension of it, which it's clear from Putin on horseback uh, with a bear, you know, without a shirt to Bolsonaro saying uh, to a fellow legislator before he was elected president, you're too ugly to rape, um, to, uh, you know, Erdogan and Orban and the polls saying that it's Western gender ideology that they're fighting because uh, to Xi uh, launching a recent campaign against sissy boys because it was emasculating Chinese uh, men and making them militarily weak. And there's too much K-pop uh, you know, fans in, in China. It's like they are obsessed with the decline of patriarchy and heteronormativity around the world. This is as much uh, a privileged male uh, backlash around the world against the changing sex and gender norms of, of a, a 21st century, as it is these economic and racial nationalist narratives. And as I've already said, it's also a climate uh, crisis thing, because if we didn't have all this plutocratic wealth in the hands of fossil fuel companies, we wouldn't be in this situation. I guess what I've been seeing is a lot of confusion about what sources to trust. Um, when it comes to reports about the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so of the people who don't, who, who are unsure of my friends, who seem to be unsure about what's going on, um, yes, I guess they, they, they don't know where they can turn in order to get correct opinions. And they, they think they need to see um, like perspectives from different angles. Uh, and, and I guess that's, that sounds reasonable, but there's a lot of fake news. There's a lot of distortion out there. There's, there's just so much information that people can't swallow it and process it all. It's really complex. So um, from a sociologist's point of view, who has been watching this happen over a long period of time, you've, you know, you've seen the rise of the internet pretty much, or the popularization of the internet. You've seen how news has evolved over many decades. What can be done in order to um, to combat a fake news and b um, sort of not necessarily fake, but uh, you know, Russell conjugating? Have you ever heard of Russell conjugation? Um, basically, lying with the truth, couching. Um, things in words that can influence people in certain directions. Um, yeah. So what can be done in order to help people make sense of the chaos and know where to turn to, to find accurate information? Well, I think one thing that is demonstrably not working is the idea of critical education, even if we could get people to practice it and take it seriously. Um, you know, the experiments that have been done to educate people about all sides of an issue and see if it changes anybody's mind, it doesn't. Uh, you know, you go in with your prejudices, you have your confirmation bias, you listen to the parts that you want and you come out none the wiser. Um, and so I think that's a problem. Um, I think, you know, I do sometimes have utopian hopes that artificial intelligence tools will improve on confirmation bias. You know that, so for instance, in the fog of war situation we're in right now, you see a picture online and someone says, look at this burned out tank. Isn't it hilarious that the Russians 
um, tanks are failing and, you know, being uh, in such a terrible way. But it could be a Ukrainian tank. You don't know. Um, and Facebook and Twitter, uh, et cetera, are attempting to come up with artificial intelligence and human monitors for the news cycle ever since the 2016 election and all the pressure that they came under after that. Um, they've been trying to come up with flags like YouTube has flags. This is state-sponsored media. If you go to you know, Russia Today, it should be a clue, but Russia Today or uh, the, you know, the Chinese state media outlets. And they're trying to label everything as state media. But there's no label if you're a shill for you know, what the Chinese call the white monkeys. Um, if you're the people who repeat Chinese state propaganda for free, there's no label on your commentary that, that you're a shill. Um, so I think there is a huge problem with how we identify and label and, and deal with it. Um, and this is, I don't, I don't know that this is worse uh, because of the of technology. One of the narratives that I'm constantly pushing back against is the idea that somehow some technology made things worse. If you look back, you know, one of the first uses of an image in, by, in a printing press was a fake news story about a comet that had landed in France and that was somehow, according to the person who put this picture of this comet in this pamphlet, this was a sign that the local bishop was, you know, in the league with the devil or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's not like the history of the press has been free from fake news. I mean, almost all of the press was politically motivated since the very beginning. The idea of a dispassionate, you know, I, I, I do credit Voltaire and the encyclopedists with the idea that we should try to come up with uh, a common uh, consensus vision of reality and, and science and the way the world works. But if you read the encyclopedia, it had plenty of opinions in it as well. So I, I don't know that I ever believe that any media is truly uh, uh, free of those kinds of biases. And this is one of the logics behind a liberal democratic society, because in the absence of anybody being rational and uh, any particular news source being verifiable as the truth, well, the best that we can do is to let a thousand flowers bloom and hope that out of all of that kind of discourse, people will not uh, hold on to illusions. Now, I'm a little less optimistic about this than I would have been before 2016, because I think it's pretty clear in the United States that even if you tell people, hey, don't eat that, it will kill you. They'll say, oh, don't lie to me about this. Um, and so I don't know that, you know, that, that many people have that faith in liberal democracy today that a free press and a free a play of ideas is necessarily gonna lead to better truth and a better outcome. But I don't think there's any alternative to it. I think that's really the answer. Right. I mean, a lot of people have um, brought up education as a tool to help people sort through the the noise, the distortions and stuff, because it, it, it seems really difficult for, for the most part when you're not only dealing with um, just black and white lies, but you're dealing with um, rhetoric or Russell conjugation, as I mentioned before, where you have sort of um, a lot of commentary couched in very emotive terms but um, to the effect that you can nudge people uh, to make certain decisions, whether that be political or buying or supporting in some way. Yeah. How do you deal with that? That seems like a really difficult problem. And I mean, you know, if we're, if we're moving ahead with uh, democracy, then people need to be informed about the types of votes that they're going to, um, yeah, about the policies of, of the parties that they, that they may support. Um, and then, you know, there's the problem of um, whether people will choose the right thing. Uh, it, it, it's well, difficult. I, people... I don't know if I have good, a good answers, but I have a good question, which is um, I, have, I am very interested as a social scientist in whether there's any way, and, and if people have ideas about this, please feel free to contact me. If there's any way to measure um, a population's degree of epistemological uncertainty, and, you know, epistemological uncertainty is not bad. It's good to be epistemologically uncertain. But sometimes I wonder, and I, I, this came up because of the uh, simulation argument. It's like I started to see references to Nick's simulation argument, which is, has, you know, 
precursors, historical precursors. And I'm like, well, are there particular times and places where people start to say, could this be real? Am I living in a fantasy? You know, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and, you know, are there, is, is it when events change so rapidly uh, that people start to lose their, you know, have anomie, as Durkheim would have said? Or um, is it actually being exacerbated? By an, uh, an internet, by by media like the Matrix, that um, suggest to vulnerable people that um, they could just be a head in a box or something like that, or by the internet itself, which is full of misinformation and uh, you know motivated reasoning. Um, so I, I have that question, and I don't know. I and I think it's important to, to say it, if people being irrational and just believing whatever the hell they want and people saying what, uh, all kinds of crazy motivated things that aren't true, if that's just the constant in human history and we notice it sometimes and we don't notice it others and sometimes it wins elections and sometimes it doesn't, then I don't think it's, um, you know, I don't think that we need to be as worried. But if there actually is a rise in that kind of uncertainty, if people actually um, and I, I think the QAnon, if the investigation of the QAnon, you know about QAnon? Okay. I'll, I don't I'll know just, very much. Okay. I'll just say in a nutshell, the QAnon phenomenon is a massive conspiracy theory with many, many different flavors and sub variations. But the, the core of it is that Democrats in the United States, uh, and especially the Clintons, are the head of a, and I'm not making this up, a satanic cult that's uh, principal occupation is stealing children for satanic, uh, fatal, fatal satanic and pedophilic rights. Um, and so that's why, you know, five years, four years ago, a guy ran into a pizza store in Washington, DC and started to threaten people with an automatic weapon because he was, he'd been told by the QAnon conspiracy that there was a sex dungeon for children in the basement of the pizza store. So this QAnon conspiracy has become an object of fascination by many political scientists and sociologists because it now connects to every single conspiracy. You know, it's, it's the Jews and it's the bankers and it's, uh, you know, Trump and, Trump was, uh, the, it was the QAnon people who expected that Trump would not uh, lose the election. And then they said he was actually gonna uh, seize power before Biden took office. And now he, they say he's gonna be coming back to power and they may get their wish because he is saying that he wants to run again. But um, this kind of irrationality really haven't seen its impact on the American political stage since the John Birch Society and the far the, the mobilization of the far right that eventually led to Reagan um, in the 1950s and 1960s. And back then, the mainstream conservatives eventually shunned these people. But right now, Trump, because Trump is in bed with this kind of conspiracy uh, theory movement, um, they have a real hard time getting rid of it, even though they're made extremely uncomfortable by some of the elected representatives who parrot this kind of nonsense and who consort with neo-Nazis in the United States and therefore bring into exposure the fascistic undertones of contemporary Republican politics. So um, I think that there is, uh, it's an extremely important political science question. How do you combat a culture of conspiracy where it's completely disengaged from reality and, um, and I don't know if there's an answer because it's extremely influential. And it's influential in Australia as well. I've heard that uh, you have some, wasn't there an oil magnate in Australia, like New Queensland or something like that, uh, who was a far right politician and who was, you know, big on the conspiracies? Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if they were from Queensland or the oil magnet. I, I, I'm not sure um, who you're referring to. Yeah. Um, but in, in, in maybe, maybe. Uh, look, um, so I guess, what was the question? Um, so, okay, so what about like, a, I mean, we know in science that we can, um, we can back our facts up by doing uh, peer reviews and replication tests. And we've got a, you know, a framework of meta science to um, detect whether people are doing good or bad science. 
and and it's getting better right um now i'm just wondering i'm not sure if you're um okay with a lot of the meta science stuff but in general could we take principles from uh the way in which we ensure accuracy of scientific um knowledge scientific data and 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 i guess um i guess representations of that data uh interpretations of that data so can we use this framework to inform how we um fact check can we develop fact checkers that um you know are, are reasonably reliable that people can trust and we can actually show that they're trustworthy well again facebook's experimenting with this you know linking stories that get flagged and say if you you know this story has been flagged as potentially misleading if you want to see more about this particular story, you can go to this link to go to Snopes or whatever, you know, the fact checking websites. And I do support that. I think that's an interesting experiment. Um, it is inevitably going to flag things that people don't think should be flagged and not flag things that people should think should be flagged because people come at these things with all different kinds of perspectives. So I'm not sure that in the end it's going to satisfy that many people, but I do think that that's part of the answer, but part of the problem here is that there's an asymmetry between motivated uh, irrational uh, claims on the right or anybody's ir motivated irrational claims and the claim of scientific objectivity. The, the asymmetry is that someone who believes in scientific objectivity also believes in a large scope for interpretation, and uh, the lack of certainty, you know, that uh, further evidence, you know, when I say that I don't believe in conspiracies, it's not because I don't believe that there are conspiracies. There are conspiracies. It's just that I, I'm pretty sure in general, the forces of history move events instead of particular conspiracies. And that it's, you know, and, and I think um, it's possible that some things could have been had a conspiracy behind them, but I just don't think it's a, the best explanation. If you have that kind of a scientific approach, you are weaker in an argument uh, when you're arguing with someone who says, I don't, A, I don't care about the facts because B, I'm absolutely certain that God exists and that you're a Satanist. What do you, how do you argue with that? You say, well, I don't think so.